The problem of increasing human energy, with special references to the harnessing of the sun's energy, by Nikola Tesla, Century Illustrated Magazine, June 1900. The first problem, how to increase the human mass, the burning of atmospheric nitrogen. View generally, there are obviously two ways of increasing the mass of mankind. First, by aiding and maintaining those forces and conditions which tend to increase it and second, by opposing and reducing those which tend to diminish it. The mass will be increased by careful attention to health, by substantial food, by moderation, by regularity of habits, by promotion of marriage, by conscientious attention to children, and generally stated, by the observance of all the many precepts and laws of religion and hygiene. But in adding new mass to the old, three cases again present themselves. Either the mass is added of the same velocity as the old, or it is of smaller or of a higher velocity. To gain an idea of the relative importance of these cases, imagine a train composed of, say, 100 locomotives running on a track, and suppose that, to increase the energy of the moving mass, four more locomotives are added to the train. If these four move at the same velocity at which the train is going, the total energy will be increased 4%. If they are moving at only half of that velocity, the increase will amount to only 1%. If they are moving at twice that velocity, the increase of energy will be 16%. This simple illustration shows that it is of greatest importance to add mass of a higher velocity. Stated more to the point, if, for example, the children be of the same degree of enlightenment as the parents, that is, mass of the same velocity, the energy will simply increase proportionally to the number added. If they are less intelligent or advanced, or mass of smaller velocity, there will be a very slight gain in the energy. But if they are further advanced, or mass of higher velocity, then the new generation will add very considerably to the sum total of human energy. Any addition of mass of smaller velocity beyond that indispensable amount required by the law expressed in the proverb, men sana in corporo sano should be strenuously opposed. For instance, the mere development of muscle as aimed in some of our colleges, I consider equivalent to adding mass of smaller velocity, and I would not commend it, although my views were different when I was a student myself. Moderate exercise, ensuring the right balance between mind and body, and the highest efficiency of performance is, of course, a prime requirement. The above example shows that the most important result to be attained is the education or the increase of the velocity of the mass newly added. Conversely, it scarcely need be stated that everything that is against the teachings of religion and the laws of hygiene is tending to decrease the mass. Whiskey, wine, tea, coffee, tobacco, and other such stimulants are responsible for the shortening of the lives of many and ought to be used with moderation. But I do not think that rigorous measures of suppressions of habits followed through many generations are commendable. It is wiser to preach moderation than abstinence. We have become accustomed to these stimulants, and if such reforms are to be effected, they must be slow and gradual. Those who are devoting their energies to such ends could make themselves far more useful by turning their efforts in other directions, as, for instance, towards providing pure water. For every person who perishes from the effects of a stimulant, at least a thousand die from the consequences of drinking impure water. This precious fluid, which daily infuses new life into us, is likewise the chief vehicle through which disease and death enter our bodies. The germs of destruction it conveys are enemies all the more terrible as they perform their fatal work unperceived. They seal our doom while we live and enjoy. The majority of people are so ignorant or careless in drinking water, and the consequences of this are so disastrous that a philanthropist can scarcely use his efforts better than by endeavoring to enlighten those who are thus injuring themselves. By systematic purification and sterilization of the drinking water, the human mass would be very considerably increased. It should be made a rigid rule, which might be enforced by law, to boil or to sterilize otherwise the drinking water in every household and public place. The mere filtering does not afford sufficient security against infection. 
All ice for internal usage should be artificially prepared from water thoroughly sterilized. The importance of eliminating germs of disease from the city water is generally recognized, but little is being done to improve the existing conditions, as no satisfactory method of sterilizing great quantities of water has yet been brought forward. By improved electrical appliances, we are now enabled to produce ozone cheaply and in large amounts, and this ideal disinfectant seems to offer a happy solution of the important question. Gambling, business rush, and excitement, particularly on the exchanges, are causes of mass reduction, all the more so because the individuals concerned represent units of higher value. Incapacity of observing the first symptoms of an illness and careless neglect of the same are important factors of mortality. In noting carefully every new sign of approaching danger and making conscientiously every possible effort to avert it, we are not only following wise laws of hygiene in the interest of our well-being and the success of our labors, but we are also complying with a higher moral duty. Everyone should consider his body as a priceless gift from one whom he loves above all as a marvelous work of art, of indiscernible beauty and mastery beyond human conception, and so delicate and frail that a word, a breath, a look, nay, a thought, may injure it. Uncleanliness, which breeds disease and death, is not only a self-destructive but highly immoral habit. In keeping our bodies free from infection, healthful and pure, we are expressing our reverence for the high principle with which they are endowed. He who follows the precepts of hygiene in this spirit is proving himself so far truly religious. Laxity of morals is a terrible evil which poisons both mind and body and which is responsible for a great reduction of the mass in some countries. Many of the present customs and tendencies are productive of similar hurtful results. For example, the society life, modern education, and pursuits of women tending to draw them away from their household duties and make men out of them must needs distract from the elevating ideal they represent, diminish the artistic creative power, and cause sterility and a general weakening of the race. A thousand other evils might be mentioned, but all put together and their bearing upon the problem under discussion, they could not equal a single one, the want of food brought on by poverty, destitution, and famine. Millions of individuals die yearly for want of food, thus keeping down the mass. Even in our enlightened communities, and notwithstanding the many charitable effort, this is still, in all probability, the chief evil. I do not mean here absolute want of food, but want of healthful nutriment. How to provide good and plentiful food is, therefore, a most important question of the day. On the general principles, the raising of cattle as a means of providing food is objectionable, because, in the sense interpreted above, it must undoubtedly tend to the addition of mass of a smaller velocity. It is certainly preferable to raise vegetables, and I think, therefore, that vegetarianism is a commendable departure from the established barbarous habit. That we can subsist on plant food and perform our work even to advantage is not a theory, but a well-demonstrated fact. Many races living almost exclusively on vegetables are of superior physique and strength. There is no doubt that some plant food, such as oatmeal, is more economical than meat and superior to it in regard to both mechanical and mental performance. Such food, moreover, taxes our digestive organs decidedly less and in making us more contented and sociable, produces an amount of good difficult to estimate. In view of these facts, every effort should be made to stop the wanton of cruel slaughter of animals, which must be destructive to our morals. To free ourselves from animal instincts and appetites which keep us down, we should begin at the very root from which we spring. We should effect a radical reform in the character of the food. There seems to be no philosophical necessity for food. We can conceive of organized beings living without nourishment and deriving all the energy they need from the performance of their life functions from the ambient medium. In a crystal, we have the clear evidence of the existence of a formative life principle, and though we cannot understand the life of a crystal, it is nonetheless a living being. There may be, besides crystals, other such individualized material systems of being, perhaps of gaseous constitution or composed of substance still more tenuous. In view of this possibility, nay probability, we cannot apodictically deny the existence of organized beings on a planet merely because the conditions on the same are unsuitable for the existence of life as we conceive it. 
We cannot even, with positive assurance, assert that some of them might not be present here, in this our world, in the very midst of us, for their constitution and life manifestation may be such that we are unable to perceive them. The production of artificial food as a means for causing an increase of the human mass naturally suggests itself, but a direct attempt of this kind to provide nourishment does not appear to me rational, at least not for the present. Whether we could thrive on such food is very doubtful. We are the result of ages of continuous adaptation, and we cannot radically change without unforeseen and in all probability disastrous consequences. So uncertain an experiment should not be tried. By far the best way, it seems to me, to meet the ravages of the evil would be to find ways of increasing the productivity of the soil. With this object, the preservation of forests is of an importance which cannot be overestimated. And in this connection, also the utilization of water power for purposes of electrical transmission, dispensing in many ways with the necessity of burning wood, and tending thereby to forest preservation is to be strongly advocated. But there are limits in the improvement to be effected in this and similar ways. To increase materially the productivity of the soil, it must be more effectively fertilized by artificial means. The question of food production resolves itself then into the question how best to fertilize the soil. What is it that made the soil still a mystery? To explain its origin is probably equivalent to explaining the origin of life itself. The rocks, disintegrated by moisture and heat and wind and weather, were in themselves not capable of maintaining life. Some unexplained condition arose, and some new principle came into effect, and the first layer capable of sustaining low organisms, like mosses, was formed. These, by their life and death, added more of their life-sustaining quality to the soil, and higher organisms could then subsist, and so on and so on, until at last highly developed plant and animal life could flourish. But though these theories are, even now, not in agreement as to how fertilization is effective, it is a fact only too well ascertained that the soil cannot indefinitely sustain life and some way must be found to supply it with substances which have been abstracted from it by the plants. The chief and most valuable amongst these substances are compounds of nitrogen, and the cheap production of these is, therefore, the key for the solution of all important food production. Our atmosphere contains an inexhaustible amount of nitrogen, and could we but oxidize it and produce these compounds, an incalculable benefit for mankind would follow. Long ago, this idea took a powerful hold on the imagination of scientific men but an efficient means for accomplishing this result could not be devised. The problem was rendered extremely difficult by the extraordinary inertness of the nitrogen, which refuses to combine even with oxygen. But here, electricity comes to our aid. The dormant affinities of the element are awakened by an electric current of the proper quality. As a lump of coal which has been in contact with oxygen for centuries without burning will combine with it when once ignited, so nitrogen excited by electricity will burn. I did not succeed, however, in producing electrical discharges exciting very effectively the atmospheric nitrogen until a comparatively recent date, although I showed in May 1891 in a scientific lecture a novel form of discharge or electrical flame named St. Elmo's Hot Fire, which besides being capable of generating ozone in abundance, also possessed as I pointed out on that occasion, distinctively the quality of exciting chemical affinities. This discharge or flame was then only three or four inches long. Its chemical action was likewise very feeble, and consequently the process of oxidation of nitrogen was wasteful. How to intensify this action was the question. Evidently, electrical currents of a peculiar kind had to be produced in order to render the process of nitrogen combustion more efficient. The first advance was made in ascertaining that the chemical activity of the discharge was very considerably increased by using currents of extremely high frequency or rate of vibration. This was an important improvement, but practical considerations soon set a definite limit to the progress in this direction. 
Next, the effects of the electrical pressure of the current impulses of their waveform and other characteristic features were investigated. Then, the influence of atmospheric pressure and temperature and of the presence of water and other bodies was studied, and thus, the best conditions for causing the most intense chemical reaction of the discharge and securing the highest efficiency of the process were gradually ascertained. Naturally, the improvements were not quick in coming. Still, little by little, I advanced. The flame grew larger and larger, and its oxidizing action grew more intense. From an insignificant brush discharge a few inches long, it developed into a marvelous electrical phenomenon, a roaring blaze, devouring the nitrogen of the atmosphere and measuring 60 or 70 feet across. Thus slowly, almost imperceptibly, possibility became accomplishment. All is not yet done, by any means. But to what a degree my efforts have been rewarded, an idea may be gained from an inspection of figure one, which, with its title, is self-explanatory. The flame-like discharge visible is produced by the intense electrical oscillations which pass through the coil shown and violently agitate the electrified molecules of the air. By this means, a strong affinity is created between the two normally indifferent constituents of the atmosphere, even if no further provision is made for intensifying the chemical action of the discharge. In the manufacture of nitrogen compounds by this method, of course, every possible means bearing upon the intensity of this action and the efficiency of this project will be taken advantage of. And, besides, special arrangements will be provided for the fixation of the compounds formed, as they are generally unstable, the nitrogen becoming again inert after a little lapse of time. Steam is a simple and effective means for fixing permanently the compounds. The result illustrated makes it practicable to oxidize the atmospheric nitrogen in unlimited quantities, merely by the use of cheap mechanical power and simple electrical apparatus. In this manner, many compounds of nitrogen may be manufactured all over the world at a small cost and in any desired amount. And by means of these compounds, the soil can be fertilized and its productiveness indefinitely increased. An abundance of cheap and healthful food, not artificial, but such as we are accustomed to, may thus be obtained. This new and inexhaustible source of food supply will be of uncalculable benefit to mankind, for it will enormously contribute to the increase of the human mass, and thus immensely adding to human energy. Soon, I hope, the world will see the beginning of an industry which, in time to come, will, I believe, be in importance next to that if iron.